In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. So we all know that uh, at this point in the service on any given uh, Sunday morning, right after the gospel, we take a little bit of time to think together and talk about the meaning of the story which we uh, just heard, and we try to figure out some way that our uh, life might be connected to that story and whether there's something in that story that can uh, feed us. This morning, though, I want to take um, a little uh, break from what is our normal custom so that uh, we can uh, think together and I can talk with you a little bit about uh, what uh, lies ahead for us um, over this next uh, year or so in this in-between time, um, between the time that Randy has uh, gone up the road, so to speak, and the, uh, our new uh, rector uh, comes uh, to be with us. Uh, I was uh, asking um, our staff um, um, a few days ago that if they were you sitting in the pew, you know, what kind of thing would you want to be hearing from, uh, from uh, me? And they said, well, you really need to tell them something about yourself. And I thought, okay, I, I can do that. It feels a little awkward, really, to uh, stand up here and, and talk about yourself first off. But the, the fact of the matter is, is that um, I only know just a very few of you, a very few. Some of you I know from a long time back, but uh, um, for the most part, uh, I think I'm likely to be a stranger to you, and I know that many of you are strangers to me. And so here at the beginning, I like to kind of... Uh, See if we can help ourselves uh, a little bit. So, um, my name is Tom. Uh, <laughs> it's Tom Blair. It's my full name, and I've been in this world about a little over 72 years now, which is a long pull. And um, um, I've been um, ordained for 45 or 46 years now, um, and most of my life has been uh, spent in the parish ministry. My dad was a clergyman also, and he spent his entire life in um, parish ministry. He started out actually right up here in 1949 at St. Paul's at Hanover Courthouse. Um, in any event, uh, I've been retired for, for about 12 years now, almost entirely retired, except for teaching uh, uh, the class down there on, um, right down there on Sunday mornings for the last, uh, last two years or so, and uh, I served last as the rector of uh, St. Stephen's out there on Grove Avenue. It's a church that's famously called St. Convenience, and <laughs> I, I, I hated that when, uh, <laughs> when people would say that uh, uh, about us. And then before that, uh, I uh, worked at uh, Grace Church in Kilmarnock as a rector, there and two of my oldest friends from back then just appeared this morning. Why don't you raise your hand? There. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's such a wonderful surprise. Um, in any event, there were many places uh, uh, before that, um, but now, uh, but now I am, uh, I am here with you. Randy and I um, have been friends for almost uh, 20 years now, over 20 years. And I guess, I, I guess it's two months ago now, uh, on the Sunday morning after he uh, uh, had uh, sent out his letter saying that he was uh, going to cathedral, I was sitting right over there with my friend Ruth underneath that uh, beautiful angel um, window there. And Randy was up here. He was holding onto this lectern very tightly. I could tell that. And uh, at the beginning of his sermon, if you were here, you remember this. I think I remember it rightly. At the beginning of his sermon, um, uh, he, he put on this uh, pretend look of innocence that only he can, only he can really do. <laughs> it, was, it was feigned, and, uh, but it was convincing. And he looked up and he said, say, so is anything new happening? <laughs> of course, I think that's what he said. And, and we all... We all laughed, and most of us, well, most of us laughed. Not all of us laughed, but, but most of us laughed. And between that day um, and this day, I have become um, 
much to my, really much to my surprise, your, uh, your interim rector. So I am, I am the, the title is interim rector, and it's, the title is meant to convey some information. Part of the information is, is that whoever is the interim, interim, interim rector, you know, it's, it's meant to, to uh, testify that this person is temporary, that, that an interim rector is one who, uh, it's a little bit like a, um, a substitute teacher. You know, <laughs> you know, we all had substitute teachers back in the day, and um, the, the work of a substitute teacher is to kind of uh, hold the fort until the real teacher reappears. <laughs> and so my job, uh, is similar to that in that uh, I, I, uh, I am meant to hold the fort here until, um, until our new rector comes. And I think that with any luck, uh, a year from now, we should be very close, uh, very close to that, maybe a little bit longer, but um, when that day comes, when the new rector does come, I will go back down to the pews where you are now and... Uh, um, We'll welcome that new person here, and I, I promise you, I will be the happiest man in this church. <laughs> it's true. I will be. I will be. I will be really. I will be really happy when that happens. <laughs> so, in the meantime, though, um, in this next uh, 12 to 14 months, we're going to be on a kind of adventure together. Um, all of us uh, here at this. Uh, in this congregation, in this community, we're going to be taking a, I guess you could say we'd be taking a kind of journey together. One of the difficult things about it is, though, is that, you know, most journeys are journeys that we chose. We go on a journey because we wanted to, we wanted to go. It was part of what the, what the thing is, but, but you don't have to think very long to realize that this is a journey that uh, none of us signed up for, that uh, none of us, I, I would assume, would have chosen to, um, to see the day when Randy uh, left and went to some other, some other place. And, you know, most of us would, if truth, you know, were to be told, uh, including myself, most of us would quite prefer it would be Randy up here talking to you and not uh, some person that you, uh, that you don't know very, very well. In any event, um, because the journey is... is the way it is, and because of what happened, you know, there are likely, you know, f folk among us who feel really sad about this, and there's a good reason to feel sad about this, to, to realize that, that someone who's been such a part of your congregation and part of your life for so long has gone away, and he's not coming back to be, uh, to be your rector. So most of us feel a sense of loss and uh, missing him and, and uh, remembering him the way he was and the way he talked and the way he, uh, he was with, with you as a, as a person. So some of us are, are, are sad and missing that, and then other people uh, are a little bit nervous, a little bit antsy about what's getting ready to, to happen. Are we going to be all right? You know, one way of looking at it is if you're not a little bit nervous, you really don't know what's happening, you know. So... <laughs> so um, and, then, and then, you know, truth be told, I've come to find out the hard way that uh, sometimes when a rector leaves, uh, there are always people who are just, they are sad and they are a little worried, but they're also irked and um, sort of aggravated. At some level, sometimes it's hard when a beloved rector leaves and you feel a little bit like you've been jilted. And so, so there are a lot of uh, uncomfortable feelings usually at, in, a, in a time like this. And one of the big questions once you start out on a journey like this is what do, you, what do we do about that? And there are a lot of books written about that, but it seems to me that the best idea is just is simply to bite the bullet and recognize that we're not, none of us are angels. We're all just regular people. We're, you know, we're ordinary souls. And, and we are prone to all sorts and conditions of feelings. And, and so we might want to just um, sit with those feelings and relax into those feelings and realize that there's nothing wrong. There's not a thing wrong with missing Randy. There's not a thing wrong with wishing that he were you know, some way back here. Um, there's not a, anything wrong with being worried a little bit about what might happen, what's getting ready to happen, uh, or whether you know, it's all going to work out, whether we're going to find the right person. And so 
and so forth. So the trick is to remember that feelings, when we have them, you know, they are really not under our control. They are like wild animals. They come when they want to come and they go when they want to go. And they perch wherever they feel like perching until they're ready to leave. And, and so, you know, for us, it seems to me that one of the great virtues that we want to practice, not just think about, but actually practice over this next uh, year or so is, is the virtue of patience. And not just with one another, which is really important, but also patience with our own selves. And sometimes the slowness of the change that, uh, that transpires in our hearts. Um, patience is a wonderful, underrated virtue in church life. And so uh, I want to commend that, commend that to you uh, as, a, as kind of a, a buoy to steer by uh, while we're uh, going forward. But uh, as wonderful that, as that is, it's not, the, it's not the most important thing, at least in my vision of things. You know, the most important thing for us to do between now and then is to um, keep our bearings to keep ourselves oriented, to keep reminding ourselves of what is important and what is not important, what is essential and what is uh, not essential, and to be thinking about um, not just the day-to-day -day, uh, business of our, our life together, but the kind of people, kind of parish, the kind of congregation, community we want to be when this is all done. And, uh, you know, there. Are, when I think about that, you know, I, I think about uh, the old, uh, the old uh, explorers. And back, you know, four or five hundred years ago, there wasn't a new world. There was just the world. And they set sail in the 1400s and 1500s. They set sail, you know, from, from Spain, from Portugal, from Britain, from Italy. And they were, they were looking for a new world. But they didn't know where it was. They knew it was somewhere in the water. And so they, they set their sails out on these huge expanses of water, which, which um, you know, were, must have been just overpowering in the sense of their vastness and their, and their terror. They, they set out, they, they had no idea really when they would find sea shore again, where, where the new world was, um, but they had to get there. And one of the things that they did, I think is interesting, they kept their eye on one fixed point, one unchanging point in, in that, that maritime, oceanic, vast world. Everything around them, once they got out of sight of land, everything around them was changing. The sky was changing, the water was changing, the, the list of the, of the ship was changing, the sails were changing, you know, the sun was uh, going through its daily rotation, the moon its nightly rotation, the tides came, the tides went. Everything was changing around them except one thing. And that one thing was the North Star, Polaris. And, and, and they, they eventually found the New World, but, the, but they navigated their way to it. They sailed their way to it, you know, by uh, holding on the tiller and keeping one eye on the, one eye on the ocean and the other eye on, on the North Star. They found their way by keeping their bearings that way. Now we, you know, the North Star is not gonna do us much good on this journey that we're on. <laughs> but we have something better. We have something much better than the North Star. We have, um, so to speak, a person that we can actually follow. A real person, a P, person with a capital P. A person who is, who is real, as real as that pew that you're sitting in, as real as the air you're breathing, as real as the earth that's underneath this church, and alive, and alive, more alive than all of us put together, more alive than all the people in Richmond put together. There's more life in this person than uh, in all of us put together. And, and that person is the, is the person, we all know who that person is, so it's the person, you know, who stands at the core of all of this everything that we're doing, uh, and who has always been at the core of this. And, and that person, you know, we, we say that his name is Jesus of Nazareth. Sometimes we call him the Lord Jesus. But for our purposes here on this venture that we're on, you know, the important thing to remember is, is that he's alive, he's real, and he's not a phantom, not a figment of somebody's overheated imagination. He is not a person from the ancient world who was once alive and is now dead, 
everything that we do is based on the principle that he is alive and here, closer than close, near. Even if we can't see him, seeing is not everything it's cracked up to be. You cannot, um, we cannot see him, we cannot touch him, but we can follow him. And it's important to follow in a period like this and follow as closely as we can. We can't follow by putting our feet in his footstep like, like the old people did. But we can follow him in a really important way, and that is by hearing, listening, attending to his teaching, attending to his, his word. We, we, hear these, we can hear his word, not with our uh, ears directly, but if we listen carefully to the stories, if we listen to the, to the gospels that we've been reading for all these years, we can hear him. And we can hear his teaching. And it's the teaching that needs to be our fixed point as we go forward. Happily, happily, the teaching is not complicated. Abiding in the teaching, living the teaching, is complicated and difficult and challenging. But the teaching itself, blessedly, is very simple. Incredibly simple. So simple that sometimes we think, it's, gosh, it's got to be harder than this. But it's not. If you, if you listen carefully with not just your brain but your heart, you can hear that at the core of Jesus' teaching, at the core of his um, message, there is one unmoving fixed point, and that point has to do with the practice, the, the practice of loving kindness, the practice of human kindness to one another and in relation to our own selves. So to, to follow Jesus means to practice loving kindness. To be his disciple means to do loving kindness. To follow him means to practice, again, loving kindness. Now the wonderful thing about that is, is that it's, it's within all of our grasps. There's nobody in this room that doesn't know how to do that and hasn't, you know, we've done that sometimes, you know, tried to do that all our life. The point here in our interim period is, is that this is one of the most important things that we can do as a congregation is to concentrate our attention and our heart and our minds on that simple thing of practicing on a daily basis kindness to others and to our own selves. So, um, that's enough for this morning. It's enough to think about. Um, but I want to leave you with the thought that, you know, because this person is real and because this person is, in fact, the Lord, his will is going to get done. And his will was, you know, expressed uh, famously a, a long time ago now by, and I'm sure you've heard it before, by St. Julian. And the, the promise is that, you know, for those who intend and try and struggle to, to live into the business of abiding, uh, abiding in uh, the practice of, of uh, human kindness, uh, loving kindness, that in the end, for all of us, you know, all, as Julian said, all will be well, all shall be well, all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well. So my idea is to encourage us to, you know, fix that in our brains and uh, practice that as, as best we can between now and the end. And then when the end comes, we'll, we'll really have something to celebrate, uh, celebrate together. So uh, thank you. I uh, look forward to meeting you at the back door. And if you would just be kind enough to tell me your name this time and many times after that, I would really appreciate it. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>